I don't know if I was waiting for someone to introduce me or not. So now a man who knows needs no introduction, me. Okay. Um, I stole that joke from Futurama. So. Uh, okay. Today we're going to talk about uh, thread safe and thread neutral bags. Um, my name is Rich Saunders. I'm from Rincon Research Corporation. I'd like to thank my company for graciously allowing me to present this work and paying for the conference for me. Um, just so that the joke gets made at least one time during the presentation, it's not my bag, baby. It's not my bag. So someone had to make the joke at some point. Okay. Here's kind of a quick overview of where we'll be going. Um, we're going to talk about the work crew, uh, the slowest worker problem, and uh, two different implementations of the notion of an abstract bag and talk about three other issues, uh, two or three other issues that come into the uh, play in the implementation, false sharing as well as hyper-threading problems. And we'll end up with uh, concluding, talk about how all this fits together. Okay. So this all started out, it's Josh's fault. Josh is like, hey Rich, I've got this 20 minute long computation. We're doing a 20 minute long calf and it's really cool. You gotta see it. So I'm like, okay, so I run down to his office and we sit there talking about what he's doing. He's doing a 20 minute calf. And it's like, wow, 20 minutes seems to take forever. So we're watching it run. And he threw like eight threads at it. And like, as we're watching it run, it goes down from eight threads to seven. And then we watch it for a while. That's kind of weird. I know how this implementation works. It should six. And over the course of the last five minutes of the computation, it kind of very slowly counted down through the threads. And you're like, what's going on here? It seemed like all the threads should be finishing at the same time. And if they did finish all at the same time, the calf would be significantly faster. In our case, it probably been about five minutes faster. So from 20 minutes to a 15 minute runtime to compute this giant thing. And so because of this, I'm like, we need to fix this because you know, Josh is gonna be doing these calves all the time. So let's figure out a way to do that. And that's what sort of started all of this. Incidentally, this is, um, this is kind of an experience paper. I sort of took this problem that Josh had and we sort of ran with it, tried to figure out what was going wrong, what was going wrong here. So we're, this is sort of a journey, an unexpected journey through the, uh, through the calf plane and with threads and multi-threaded programming. Uh, as we're going through uh, part of our journey, we've had thread neutrality. We talk about thread safety, hyper-threading, the slowest worker problem, which is basically what we just described here, uh, false sharing, and of course what's most important to us is C++ atomics and how can they make our life a little bit better. Okay, so what is the cross ambiguity function? It's a little hard to see here, but a, a, this is sort of what we're computing when we're computing a cross ambiguity function. I'll call it a calf probably for the rest of the, of the talk. It's a 2D structure. Um, it's basically a giant 2D array specified in a TDOA and FDOA. And in the middle here is where some energy meets. Um, the, what you should think of it as a really giant 2D array where we're doing a lot of computation, okay? Um, the calf is a digital signal processing bread and butter function, okay? What you're really computing it is time difference arrival versus frequency difference of arrival. You have two signals and they have different frequencies and different uh, time shifts. And you're trying to find the place where, because due to multipath, whoops, due to multipath, where is, the, uh, where is it maximized, okay? And that's what the little peak in the middle means. I don't expect you to, I'm not, this is not a seminar teaching you how to do calves, but I wanted you to at least have a sense of what the calf is. Um, it is an embarrassingly parallel computation. Every single line of the calf be computed in one thread if we wanted to. In this particular calf, there's on the order of about 90 lines, 90 TDOA lines, and each one of these lines could be computed in parallel if we had a machine with 90 threads on it, okay? So it's an embarrassingly parallel problem, okay? Uh, the other thing I do want to point out is that each line is relatively expensive to compute because what it's doing is uh, part of a convolution and it's doing an uh, inverse FFT on it. And so it's a little bit expensive to compute every line of this. This is why it's a good candidate for parallelism because if we did this all in one thread, it would take much longer than 20 minutes. Okay. So like I said, I went into Josh's office and I was sort of surprised when I saw this behavior. Because th this, uh, this is the original implementation. You have the calf plane, and what you do is, let's say you have three or four threads. Um, you take it, and a priori said, okay, the first thread's gonna get the first 30 lines of the calf, and the next thread's gonna get the next 30 lines, and the last thread will get the last 30 lines. So we a priori, or ahead of time, divide up the work to be done of this calf. And when all of these threads finish, the final calf, image, uh, calf, final calf image is generated, and we can say, great, we're all done. Okay, so this is a simple way to divide the work. It made sense at the time we were doing this. Uh, worker one or thread one gets X pieces of work. 
worker two gets X pieces of work, and so on. And it seems like a fair way to go. So ideally, if your work is divided up a priori, each worker is going to get the same amount of work, and each worker will finish at about the same time. Realistically, what we saw in Josh's office is that each worker takes a different amount of time. And why is that? Well, a couple of things to our investigations we found. First of all, threads get scheduled by the operating system differently. We've all brought up a top or your favorite monitor to watch CPUs and saw as processes migrated around, you're like, oh, there's a TLB hit. Oh, there's another TLB hit. Oh, every time you see a process migrate, you're like, oh, there, I just lost a little bit of performance. Okay? So even just a little bit of scheduling and moving stuff around is going to cost a little bit of time. Um, other applications running simultaneously on here are going to interfere with the worker's consistency. In the CAF we're running, we're actually running with a whole bunch of other threads computing other things like doing a TFD up front and some other stuff as well. Okay? And not, even if you have the machine all to yourself, there's things like the file system, the swapper. They're all processes running that could potentially even slightly interfere with running times. So there's always going to be at least probably something that might just slightly tweak your running times. Uh, a big one for us is hyperthreading, and which we'll talk about in the second half of the talk. Yes, sir. Okay, I was going to talk a little about CPU affinity, but since you brought it up, I see CPU affinity is sort of like the GNU public license. Once you put it somewhere, you have to put it everywhere, and that makes it hard for your application to scale. Right, but you're absolutely right. That is one way to, to mitigate some of that problem. Like once you do, uh, oh, the question was, why don't you use CPU affinity? Um, uh, because it seems like that's a way to, to stop at least some of the migration. That would so definitely solve the migration problem, but it wouldn't necessarily solve some of the other problems we see here. Okay. Okay. So what's the slowest worker problem? This is the problem we saw in Josh's office. Okay. One worker, let's say Fred, got scheduled, went off to get a pizza, and everybody else is working on their merry way, working, working, working. And then they're all done, and they're still waiting for Fred, who's got his pizza. He's like, oh, I got work to do? OK, I better do my last three lines of the calf. And so everyone's kind of waiting, waiting. OK, Fred's done. Now we can all go home. And that's what the slowest worker is. Scheduling inconsistencies among your workers cause the slowest worker in your work bunch to throttle the work crew. So that's the slowest worker problem. That's the problem we saw in Josh's office. OK. All right, so to mitigate some of the problems with the slowest worker problem, we're going to use a bag. Now, my company is full of uh, rascals, and I said, when I sent out the abstract for this talk, they're like, oh, a bag is a container, Rich. Thank you very much. I did not know a bag was a container, okay? So a bag is, uh, uh, it's been around for quite a while. It's a, uh, a thread-safe container for holding uh, work for multiple threads. For our, for our particular example, Think of each of these as specifying a, a particular line of the calf. Remember we said the calf is embarrassingly parallel. And each one of these pieces of work is simply one line of the calf you're going to do. So you put all the lines into one bag. And then as your workers work on it, each of your threads, they're going to say, oh, I'm going to get one line to compute. I'm going to get a different line to compute. I'm going to get a different line to compute. And so that's what the bag will be for, so that all these workers can just pull calf lines out of the bag to work on. Okay? And the single operation, the fundamental operation, the bag supports the get operation, just to get one piece of work out of the bag. Okay, so what's the work crew? This is the definition that comes from the Butenhof book. If you've been doing threads for a long time, you know the Butenhof book was sort of standard in the 90s and the 2000s for uh, having to do threads and POSIX threads. And this is his definition of the work crew. But of course, it's much more familiar to nowadays as the MapReduce model or the OpenMP model. Okay. So if we think of the work crew as you have some uh, input, you map it to a whole bunch of processors, they do their work along, and then they synthesize the result at the very end. In our case for CAF, the synthesis step, or the reduce step, is very simple because once all the threads are done, they've computed the, th um, the CAF and they're all done. But of course, it can be much more complicated for your reduce step. And again, OpenMP is very much like this. Think of a program as a series of map reduce points like this. But this is the work crew. You have an input point, which you distribute all your work to a bunch of threads, and then you synthesize it and wait for all of them to finish before you can move on. Yeah, I don't need to say that. OK. In order to make this bag effective, it has, two ca it has to have two characteristics to make this work in a multi-thread environment very well. First of all, it needs to be thread safe. <coughs> That's kind of a duh, right? Uh, the state of the bag is never inconsistent among multiple threads reaching into the bag all at one time. 
And we have to make sure that each piece of work is served out exactly once. In other words, we don't want to serve the same data multiple times, and we don't want to fail to serve a piece of data in there, okay? So the th we, want we have to make sure a bag is thread safe. Now, thread neutrality is a slightly different. This is the performance part of the bag. We want to make sure that multiple threads do not impede each other's progress as they reach into the grab bag, okay? We want to avoid the collateral damage of other threads, okay? What do I mean by collateral threat damage? We've all seen the case where we have two threads running along and somehow they share some resource and it causes them to both slow down, okay? What we're trying to do is make it so as we're reaching into the bag, the threads do not impede each other's progress, okay? So that's the notion of thread neutrality. Um, when you hear of thread neutrality, you should think lack of collateral damage. This thread does not affect the running thread, running time of this thread over here. And that's what we're trying to achieve. This is the, let's make it performant. Let's sort of make sure that the bag under multiple threads is performant as well as thread safe. Because it's easy to make something thread safe. What do you do? Throw a lock at it. Yay, we're done. It's thread safe. Okay, but let's make it thread neutral. Okay, so why are we, why are we approaching this bag? The whole idea of the bag as opposed to the a priori way um, of distributing work, is because this allows us to do a dynamic distribution of the work. Mm, excuse me, going through puberty here. <clears throat> the bag allows threads to pull dynamically a piece of work whenever they need it, as opposed to the a priori method. And basically, this goes back to Fred. Fred's over here with his pizza, you know, working on eating away. Hey, guys, I'll, I'll be up there with you in a second. In the meantime, everyone's like, dude, just take Fred's work and do his stuff for us so we can get out of here sooner. And so what happens is all the other workers take Fred's work, do his stuff so that even though Fred's still eating his pizza over here, it's like, yeah, yeah, Fred, we did all your work. We can all go home now. So the whole idea is that we dynamically distribute the work so that even if some of the worker threads get scheduled slightly differently, they'll all finish at about the same time so we can go home. So if there's one thread that was screwing up and causing major problems, we can take his work and give it to somebody else, okay? So, of course, the caveat to this method we still have to be able to divide up the work into a small enough quanta. So for example, I said that the calf was embarrassingly parallel, but imagine if I said, well, the only way you can get parallelism on the calf is to split up into two pieces. That's really not very parallel, right? One thread does the first half, another thread does the second. It's not really, it's, uh, you can't get much, that's a very big quanta and it's gonna be very hard to throw lots of workers at it, okay? So there's kind of a sweet spot for work size. You know, you want to find something that's big enough that you can do significant work per thread, but, s but not too small that it might cause potential issues. Although, we will do some work to show that you can actually get very small size granularity of work and still be able to get a thread neutral bag. Okay? Our purpose of all of this, we want to use the bag to avoid slowdowns from scheduling inconsistencies. Okay? That's the purpose of the bag. We're going to take advantage of the dynamic nature of the bag to keep the work flowing cleanly through all the workers, okay? So just to be clear, we're not proposing some kind of 2x or 10x kind of piece of work here. Really the purpose of this is to try to make it so that we um, um, make it so that all the threads finish at about the same time. Yes, sir? Um, what do you mean by having a so so um, like I said, with the bag, imagine that the work has been, oh, the question is, say, say it one more time, please. What do we mean by dynamically? In, in the, what, do we, uh, what do we mean by dynamically? In the previous scheme, we said, okay, thread one, you always get these three li 30 lines. Thread two, you always get three 30. By dynamically for the bag, whenever a, a worker is ready to work on something, it does a get dynamically at runtime. It's like, okay, I've got this single line. I compute it. I put it where it's going to go in the calf. And then I do another get. So as I'm running through the life cycle of a worker, I'm dynamically getting a get whenever I'm, I as a thread need work to do. As opposed to beforehand, before I do the, uh, the work crew, I, I, I would um, a priori divide all the work up. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. Okay, so what's a bag? Yes, my friend Joe's like, yes, a bag is a container. Okay, it's got one operation, it's very simple. It's got a git, which turns a single piece of work for one worker thread, okay? So what's the interface look like? You know, I tried to look at a little bit of prior art, did a quick Google. One of the first thing that comes up is the Microsoft Concurrent Bag, and it scared me. It had a really big, nasty, clumsy interface. I'm like, there's a lot of threading going on here. What are the threading guarantees of this particular container? And it really scared me. Then I kind of stepped back and said, you know what? All I really need are integers, because I can specify 
if I have a, some simple integers, I can use that as an index into a vector for my work. Okay? So a simple way to do a bag is that I'm only going to return integers, which will be indexes from 0 to n, n to 1. And the real work, whatever that means, are they file names? Is it a pointer to some giant data structure? Whatever you want, put the real work into a well-understood container like the STL vector, where the bag is simply going to give you indexes into the vector. Okay? So the whole idea here is we're going to leverage, leverage the STL vector or your favorite threaded container. So what, what I'm trying to do here is separate mechanism and policy. I don't know necessarily how I want to keep my work. Well, do I have to share a transaction lock so that when I put stuff in my vector, I don't mess up something else? Or do, can I just use my own lock inside my vector? I don't want to have to care about that. All I want to do is give you integers from 0 to n minus 1, and you can use those as indices into your favorite STL container. I don't know, is it everyone's favorite STL container? It's the one that's probably the most used, is the STL vector. So you put your work in the vector however you want, in whatever thread-safe manner you need to, to make your perfor uh, application performant. Okay? So does that make sense? You have the bag, which gives you integers, and then you store the real work in the vector. Okay? We're specifying a mechanism which allows you to implement any policy you want to handle your particular threading case. Okay? So yeah, probably the simplest interface in the world. Bag events returns false if the bag is empty. Otherwise, it's going to return true and give you an integer as a result. And after watching uh, Chandler's talk the other day, I bet he'd be mad at me for not returning this by as a struct. But I've already committed to this interface, so we're stuck with it. So. Okay. Does that make sense? Very simple interface. Ridiculously simple interface. Okay. Um, here's a very simple uh, usage of it for just like um, uh, one thread. We'd create a vector, let's say of strings, the work would be w1, w2, and w3. Notice I'm using C11 braces to initialize it. Eh? Eh? C11? Okay. The bag events, um, we're going to specify a starting integer and the length. And you'll see why we choose this interface when we get later in the talk. But basically, the bag events holds three integers 0, 1, and 2. And what's going to happen here is while I'm inside the while loop here, I do a get. This returns true if there's something in there. It fills in the index, and I use that index into my work vector, and then I go off and do whatever the heck I want to with that work. Yes, sir? So, so why does the uh, bag events take in uh, the start as, and the length? This is going to be something that we do for the next abstraction. It makes the next abstraction a little bit easier. Okay, yeah. It, Yes, I, I've got that question multiple times when I've done test talks, so we will, I promise we will address that question. Okay, so very simple idea. Inside a for loop, you're getting your work, you do whatever you need to do in another thread, whatever you need to. How do you store your data, however you want to in your vector, and that's the basic idea of the bag. Okay, so let's start off with implementation number one, the drawer. Okay, so the fundamental thread safe bag we're gonna uh, talk about in here is the eye drawer. The reason I call it iDrawer is not because I'm an Apple fun fanboy. Don't look at my Mac up here on top of the podium. Okay? I call it iDrawer because I really want to emphasize the integer nature of the bag. I want to say all I'm serving out to you is integers from 0 to n minus 1, or whatever my, my starting index was. Okay? So how do we make this thread safe? I'll give you a hint. If you went to Tony's talk the other day on atomics, we're going to take advantage of the C++11 atomics because we know that the atomic operations are atomic. Okay? So we're going to take advantage of the C11 uh, standard atomic with a four byte integer. And one of the reasons we want to take advantage of this, is, and if you didn't get a chance to see Tony's talk, is that um, these uh, C11 standard atomics are usually implemented on an architecture using the CPU's native atomic instructions. Inside of the Intel architecture, there is an atomic instruction for doing what we're going to do here in a second. Okay? So on Intel especially, because that's what the platform we cared about, many of these um, uh, C++ ops correspond to a single instruction. Okay? So what does a get do? Fundamentally, all it does, it increments an integer. Okay, that's it. Thanks for the talk. Oh, no, we got a little bit more to do. 
Okay, so let's take a look at the implementation. Real code. All right, here's the constructor where we basically have two things. The current value of um, where we currently are in the bag and an upper bound that we don't want to exceed, right? We want to serve out 0 to 9. We want to make sure at some point we don't go past 9 and serve out 10 or 11. Okay, so that's what the start and the length are here. You set current. This is the atomic integer. Okay, here's your upper bound. This doesn't have to be atomic because as you see, our usage here is simply, we can almost cache it in a register if we absolutely had to. All right, so how does get work? First of all, we make sure that our current is not greater than our upper bound. At some point, we've served out all the integers. We're done. Current is 10. Our upper bound was 9. Hey, we can't serve out any more integers. We're done. This is where the magic happens. This is why it's in bold. I wish I could make it jump out of the screen in 3D, but we don't have that uh, capability yet. This is really just a post increment. But what happens is this is done atomically because it is a standard atomic. Very simple. So we increment the current, get its value, sorry, we get the value, then increment it atomically in one instruction. And then just to make sure, we'll see why we need the second check here in a second, just to make sure we make sure we have an exceeded upper bound. As long as we haven't gone over the upper bound, hey, we're good, and we serve out this integer to our user. Okay. All that happens is every thread comes in here, does an atomic increment. So the integers come out 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in order because of the atomic nature of the C++ uh, intrinsic. This happens atomically. And it's about as fast as we can possibly do it because um, it's, I, I would argue that it's probably the fastest. Um, if you want an atomic instruction, the C++ atomic ints are probably the fastest way to do it. As soon as you start adding locks, you have to worry about things getting in the way a little bit more as soon as you add convars or something like that. So I suspect this is probably the fast way to do it, although I'd be happy to prove it wrong. And then we could post on a website and everyone else could learn from that experience. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, that's an optimization. We'll get to it later. Oh, I, hold on. Oh, unless, um, hold, I'm sorry. I may, first of all, repeat that question. There's there's one or two optimizations I wanted to get to later, but I want to make sure this was made first. Are you talking about getting rid of that first if? That's a great idea. Um, I don't know if I could repeat that. Another, another a way to do this would be to possibly have an ID where you can get your thread ID and use that as a hash. Uh, value into, um, into a hash table. You could have a bunch of integers to increment. That would be another great way to do this. Yes, sir. Or, or thread local variables, right. Dave said first. Okay. So there's lots of great ways to do this. Another optimization which was pointed out to me, we had a nice discussion idea of a, a test talk at my, you could actually even get rid of this if right here if you really wanted to. But um, Oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's an optimization. Uh, half my company, they completely half the company agreed and half the company disagreed because they're like, no, no, no. I don't want the whole notion of doing a git to potentially have a side effect if 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 it's already done. But the other half is like, yeah, but it's so much faster if you get rid of this if because then you don't have a branch prediction uh, problem. So. Yes, but, but once you're done, once you're done, you don't want to have a side effect once you're done. That, that was the point there. And again, like I said, it was my company split down the middle. So take it. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, exactly. And if your number of threads gets too large, you could potentially wrap around, which would be, yeah, that's a lot of threads. Or a lot of work. Fair enough. Okay, so uh, for correctness, we want to think of this fetch and add. It's actually the same thing, of course. Um, this is syntactic sugar for this because it's the C++ uh, 11 atomic. But if you think of it as a post increment, I think it's a little bit easier to think about. However, if I were writing code, I would prefer to see this in the code because it feels like um, you want to be able to expose, hey, this is where I'm doing an atomic operation. Let's do fetch and add instead of current plus plus because then it's easier to see, oh, we're doing something atomic there and we better be careful. Yes, sir. Say that again? Yeah, uh, but, um, okay. 
Fair enough, I probably should have done that then. There you go. From the master, Tony. <laughs> so, um, so hopefully this argues for correctness in the face of multiple threads. Each thread will increment current exactly once and the state will never be inconsistent as we increment 0, 1, 2, 3 in order of skip. So very simple bag, ridiculously, ridiculously, ridiculously simple. Okay. So why did we have two checks there? Um, like this double check lock pattern um, that we talk about for singletons, we have to have one check when we first check the singleton and potentially a second check in case two guys get in there at the same time. Okay. Uh, the metaphor I like to use for this is there's a whole bunch of people going to a new movie theater, like let's just say, see, Star Trek, okay? A whole bunch of people going in at the same time. Everyone's, there's a mad rush to the uh, theater counter, and at some point, the theater sells out. So the manager takes the sold out sign, walks to the front of the theater, puts the sold out sign, and locks the door. Unfortunately, in the time it took him to walk from behind the counter to put up the sold sign and lock the door, a whole bunch of people got in. So a whole bunch of people were given tickets, then it's like, oh crap, so we have to have one more check to make sure that there's enough seats in the actual theater uh, because otherwise we're going to give out too many things from our bag. So that's what the second check is. This first check is once the theater's sold out, we keep all the riffraff out. The second check is for if a whole bunch of people snuck in just about this time that the, upper, uh, the current was greater than the upper bound, they snuck in just as the manager was walking to the front of the theater, then they all got tickets, but they, unfortunately, some of those tickets were greater than the number of seats in the theater. And that's why you need the second check. Or you could argue maybe you don't need the first check, but you need at least one of those checks. Yes, sir. Okay. Right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Um, Sure, sure. Um, one thing I did want to point about this technique is we have to be careful. Again, it's not, it's not really a big deal, but if current reps, let's say we have four billion pieces of work and four billion workers, it's possible at the very end, if we're not careful, that current can back wrap, wrap around to zero and that breaks the whole abstraction. Realistically, this is probably not a real problem, but it is something to be careful of. We don't want current to wrap back around because if it does, then it breaks the whole idea of just all we can use in atomic increment, okay? So does that make sense? Strictly speaking, I don't think we need this first if, and this can make this a little bit faster. It's only two instructions going on here. One of them doesn't have to be atomic. So um, like I said, my company was sort of split down the middle when we were discussing it. A lot of people like this idea, this first if, because it kind of kept you out and you didn't have a side effect potentially of changing the data structure even after the bag was empty. So kind of split down the middle. If you were concerned all about performance, definitely get rid of that first if. Okay. All right, so here's an idea to implement a bag. Um, unfortunately, not everyone is at uh, C++ 11 yet. Darn it. Um, at our company, we were actually stuck back at Red Hat 3, 4, and 5 for some of our applications, and we just have to deal with it, okay? So luckily, GNU, um, we, we're a Linux shop where I work. So luckily, GNU has a very similar uh, constructs. So they have a sync, fetch, and add. So we could um, do the same idea inside of GNU if we had to. Um, and of course, for some of our systems, we actually had to do this. So, okay. so you can still support the bag idea in uh, pre so the Yes, everything else is the same. Correct. But it's just volatile. So it's, it's kind of a hack. It does seem to work. Does that make sense or not? <laughs> I 
<laughs> okay, so let's, let's talk. Uh, hopefully, we've argued that this is thread safe um, uh, in the last couple of slides, but we really want to ask ourselves is thread neutral? Um, Arguing thread neutral, neutrality is hard because really the best way to show neutrality is through running a bunch of threads at the same time and see if they interfere, okay? So we're going to try to see, run a couple of tests to see if we get a lot of collateral damage as we run. Do, does uh, running a bunch of threads in parallel, do they slow down each other or do the run times uh, make, do you see that, oh, these threads don't seem to interfere. They all run at the, about the same amount of time. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Yes, sir. Well, the problem, the problem with the collateral damage is there's all sorts of things that can slow it down two threads running at the same time. For example, two things calling to the, oh, repeat the question, what do I mean by collateral damage? There's all sorts of things that can be collateral damage. One is the heap. If you have two things calling the heap at the same time, two threads, one of them's probably going to have to do some kind of locking mechanism to protect the heap data structure. All of a sudden, this thread can go to the heap, and then it moves on. It's immediately caused this one to slow down. That's one a uh, thing we've seen a lot of in some of our uh, multi-threaded programs. Uh, sometimes collateral damage is the memory subsystem. We'll talk a little bit at the very end of the, um, the, very end of the presentation how the memory subsystem become a can become a bottleneck if we use it really, really hard and we're just uh, bonking, the, bonking it so much that it, it, it can't cause multiple threads to do stuff at the same time. Okay? So, like collateral damage, you mean not as fast as if you imagine the threat, there was only one thread on the machine and it could run, it would be done in, let's say, 10 seconds. And if you all of a sudden ran two threads on the machine, you have that nothing to do with each other, but all of a sudden the existence of two threads running at the same time slowed down your other one, so they it ran in 11 seconds, that's collateral damage. Because you've slowed down another thread, maybe that had nothing to do with a different thread. You've caused collateral damage which slowed down another thread, which you probably had nothing to do with. Does that make sense? The, the heap one is the biggest one. The heap, the heap one is kind of the biggest one because um, you know, in, in, in modern programs, you go to the heap a lot. And if I have two programs, let's say just building maps or something simple, simple like that, if one of them goes to the heap and the other one tries to go to heap at the same time, there's going to be some kind of lock mechanism which says, okay, I have to do this guy, and he's got, this guy has to stop while the other guy finishes uh, allocating his memory, and then he moves on, and then this guy can get into the heap and move on. So because of the existence of another thread accessing the heap, it slowed down this guy, even though this guy really, these two threads would have nothing to do with each other. That's what we mean by collateral damage. Does, does, that, does that make sense? Okay, I think I've beaten that to death, so. Okay, um, we're gonna talk about two, thre uh, two issues that affect, uh, affect thread neutrality. How many workers are there? More threads equals it's more likely that our current underscore is getting hit pretty hard. And the second is what kind of work is done by each thread. If we're doing a negligible amount of work, we're pretty much getting out of the bag as fast as we possibly can. Some work, we're maybe just kind of doing a little bit of work, doing a get, a little bit of work, doing a get. And then ample, where basically you do a pull, go get a pizza, come back, do another pull. We just want to make sure that under these different kinds of workloads and with different kinds of threads, what do we see, what's the behavior of the bag? All right, so in order to do this, like we said, to really test thread neutrality, we need to run tests where a bunch of threads are running at the same time, okay? So what we're going to do is here's some synthetic performance tests. Just as a note, this is synthetic performance tests. No real work is done in the running of these tests, okay? Um, we're going to plot the number of threads uh, versus time um, on our machine, okay? This particular test we're going to run, we're actually running, sorry, three tests, a negligible test, a sum test, and an ample test. Uh, we're running this on an Intel 6-CPU uh, Xeon machine, and it looks like 12 CPUs because the machine is hyper-threaded. We'll talk a, a little bit more about this later on. And the other thing we put on the graph is a perfect speed-up line. In a perfect world, n threads would run uh, n times faster because we're, um, sorry, I should back up here. What we're doing is we have a certain amount of work in the, in the bag, and all these threads are pulling from it. So if we add more threads, more workers to pulling out of the bag, that should be n times faster. If it takes 100 seconds for one worker to pull out of the bag, we hope that with two workers, it'll take 50 seconds for both of them. Okay, so that's what's going on here. N threads would be n times faster as we do our gets out of a single bag. In other words, 
we're measuring run times, so smaller is better. Smaller run times are better. Okay. And then this is the work types. In a negligible workload, we're just going to do one add per get operation. This is besides the, uh, the add of the, of the atomic int. Some will do about some hundred adds, and for ample, we'll do about a million adds per git. Okay? And again, these are, I call these synthetic performance tests because no real work is done. Okay, so let's start off where we have, we're doing a bunch of gits from a bag. We have the number of threads going here from 1 to 12. This what line here is the analytic line of a perfect speed up. In a perfect world, this line would be directly on top of it. But you'll see here that the negligible workload, as we do lots of pulls from the bag at the same time, current keeps getting hit really hard. And you see it doesn't scale very well at all. Okay, we'll come back to this. Ah, for some work type where we're doing just a little bit of work after we do a git, notice we actually get pretty good scaling. It's a little hard to see here, but the, uh, the time data is right here on the perfect speed up line up until about six threads, and then it diverges a little bit. Hmm. We'll have to talk about that here in a second. Okay, and the ample work type has a similar scaling line. Up to about six processors, it scales reasonably well. All right. So what are the conclusions we draw from this? For the ample and the sum work types, the drawer is essentially thread neutral, modulo six processors. We'll talk more about this in a second. For the negligible work, short work type, the drawer is definitely not thread neutral. Uh, the other workers slow down. We're just doing so much work here. We're hitting current so hard that there's no way they can stay out of each other's way. All these threads hitting this one variable, this one, even though it's an atomic operation, they just kind of beat the heck out of each other, okay? All right. So unfortunately, my friend uh, did not make the picture I was hoping he'd make. But for some reason, I have this picture of a drawer sitting over here and like thousands of gnomes trying to run towards the no dra drawer at the same time and pull out data as fast as they possibly can. Unfortunately, I, he didn't ever get a chance to draw the picture for me. So this is the problem with the negligible work type. All these gnomes are at the same time trying to reach into the drawer at the same time and pull out data. So they always say imagination is better than real life anyway. So use your imagination to picture a bunch of gnomes running towards a dra uh, drawer and pulling stuff out as fast as they possibly can. Okay, so, because the gnomes are very important. I have no idea why I chose gnomes. Why didn't I choose hobbits? I have no idea. Okay, so the, the, big, the big thing we want to solve now is how do we try to figure out how the neg to make the negligible work type work better, okay? And so the solution, what we're going to do is we're going to give all these gnomes, we're going to give them each their own drawer. So it kind of goes back to um, Niall's solution they talked about a second ago. We're going to give every single gnome his own drawer that he does a get from. Okay, so in C++ speak, what do we mean by this? We're going to make a vector of drawers. Okay, so it's similar to the a priori scheduling. We'll talk about how to mitigate this in just a second. But basically, each drawer gets the integers, drawer zero gets the integers zero to x. Drawer one gets the integers x plus one to two x. This is why the constructor allows you to do a start and a length. Okay, so uh, and, and like we said there, okay. Now, one thing I want to point out here is we're building the cupboard atop a primitive that already works. We've argued that the drawer is already atomic, so we don't need to add any more synchronization code. Okay? The whole idea here is we're deferring to drawer to do all the synchronization, so we don't have to add convars, um, you know, your favorite uh, uh, locking mechanism, whatever you need. The drawer handles all the stuff for us. We're just putting a simple wrapper on top with the cupboard. Okay. Oh, by the way, um, some of the feedback I got originally from this talk is I called it a cupboard, but most people like to think of this as a dresser of drawers, where you have a whole bunch of drawers. I guess this is just regionally for where I was from. We, we thought of a notion of something with a lot of drawers as a cupboard. So I apologize if you don't like the term cupboard. Um, dresser, if, if you ever see the word cupboard, think of the word dresser, and maybe that'll make you a little bit happier. Or credenza, or a Chesterfield, or if you're from like 1920. Okay. Um, by the way, this starts off like a priori, but then we, the gnomes are allowed to rifle through each other's drawers near the very end of the computation. Okay. So the get usage changes slightly. 
So we've, got our, we've still got our vector of work up here. Now this is the thread main loop. Imagine that we have um, one of these for every thread or every gnome. And what we pass in is each thread has its own thread number. Okay, so now our git has a starting drawer as well as an ending drawer. Because remember, we have a whole bunch of gnomes with their own drawers. Each gnome starts on a drawer, but at some point, if his drawer runs out of work, he's going to start rifling through his buddy's drawers. That, does, that sounds kind of bad. Um, until he finds some work that's done, and that's the drawer he ends up finding work in. And then it's like, oh, when I'm done, I'm actually going to return the work I found as well as the drawer I actually found it in. Okay? Now, just to be clear, each gnome tends to stay in its own drawer until it runs out of work. Okay, yes, sir. Okay. Have I considered using thread local storage for some stuff? I haven't. Um, I did try, let me, let me do say this. I tried a couple of different interfaces on top of this. I tried the notion of having each, I guess it was kind of like thread local storage. I had a notion of uh, each worker would do a git and would keep track of which drawers had already been looked at in a local way so that they wouldn't interfere with each other. I tried a bunch of stuff, but they never made a big performance difference. It always seemed like just letting the um, rifle through the drawers at the very end of the computation was okay. Um, I, tried, you know, I tried to mitigate that. It's like, well, it seems like with the very end of the application, all these gnomes are going to be looking through each other's drawers and getting each other's way. But since it's only once at the very end, of the work crew, it didn't seem to be too much performance difference, or at least for my testing it didn't. So I considered it. I even had a third abstraction at one point. But after I looked at the numbers, I'm like, you know, there's no reason to have a third abstraction. It doesn't seem to make a big difference. So I just kind of let them, since it only happens at the very end that you rifle through each other's drawers, it didn't seem to make a big difference. OK, so I think that's a very long answer to your question. So yes, I did consider the local storage. <laughs> Yes, sir. It does. So when, when does this happen? Uh, when this happened, the situation at the very when they start rifling through each other's drawers depends on the granularity, yes. And like I so said, this is one of the reasons I tried to do three different work types to at least try to address the issue with the negligible, the ample, and the sum work type. So, okay, just to emphasize this, once each worker is looking at a particular drawer, they tend to stay in that drawer. Um, as long as the gnomes are in different drawers, they tend to stay out of each other's way. All right. So here's the git. Really, I, I don't want to go too deeply into this, except to say that it's a vector of drawers. So this is the particular drawer a gnome is looking at. It comes in right here in the starting drawer. And if you don't find it, if you do a git and find that this, this particular drawer is empty, you go around a loop. And if you check all the drawers, and if you get all the way out, you've checked all the drawers, you return false. Okay. Like I said, I really, I really tried really hard my first incarnation of this. Like, well, it seems like you should note when you've already looked in a drawer. It didn't make a difference in my performance tests. You could argue, of course, that I just didn't do the right performance tests, and that would be a perfectly th good thing to say, because maybe I didn't do the right performance tests. OK, uh, I th think I beat this point in the ground. The cupboard relies on the drawer being correct. It, it basically leverages the thread safety of the drawer. Okay. Once the drawer is empty, it's, uh, is empty, it's empty. It can't be refilled except by creating a new cupboard. And that seems like a limitation, but this is basically the model of OpenP. OpenP params are a series of uh, map reduce points. You start off in your param, you map out, do a bunch of work, come back together, then you do another map. And kind of, uh, this is sort of the basic model of OpenMP. So this is a very valid model. A lot of people use it. So even though the Git is very simple and you can't put stuff back into the drawer, it's OK because OpenMP does this too. OK. So we have this new cupboard. This should fix the negligible work type, right? <sighs> no. Look, our performance is worse. Eh? What's going on here? Well, the sum work type is still OK, up to about six threads. The ample work type is still OK, but the negligible work type looks terrible. What is going on here? OK, obviously it didn't work. So um, 
I did some work a long time ago where we're trying to do a Python profiler. And um, if you've done any kind of profiling, you know that profiling generates potentially lots of events. We were seeing on the order of millions of events per second. And what we're trying to do is offload some of the profiling work to another processor. Okay? And the whole idea is we were communicating very quickly between a producer, something being profiled, producing millions of events per second, to another processor. All right? And so we have saw this exact same problem uh, in that scenario. All right? The problem is if we have too many threads trying to talk too quickly to each other, we would run into problems. What was the problem? Two words. False sharing. OK, what's false sharing? When two threads accidentally access the same cache line. Okay? Uh, cache, line uh, cache lines are pretty big these days. They're on the order of 32 bytes or even 64 bytes for some processors. So when access, let's say I have processor 1 and processor 2, processor 1 accesses some memory location, location 12. But what it does is it fills an entire cache line of the 64 bytes around it. <laughs> Giant memory operation. Okay. Over here, another processor accesses not location 12, but let's say location 15. It's in the same cache line, so it has to invalidate this cache line and do an entire gigantic <laughs> another 64 bytes over here. And imagine what happens if they ping pong back and forth, location 12, <laughs> location 15. <laughs> They just keep ping-ponging back and forth between the two CPUs. And that's what false sharing is, when you accidentally cause cache lines to go willy-nilly back and forth. Okay? Unfortunately, this is what's happening inside the cupboard. We said that our cupboard is implemented as a vector of drawers. Let's just recall real quick what's inside the drawer. A drawer is only two things. It's a current, which is a 32-bit int, and another 32-bit. It's two 32-bit ints. Oops, wrong way. OK. So inside of memory, this is drawer 0. And right next to it is drawer 1. So whenever we start doing things on current here, we're going to have false sharing between drawer 1 and drawer 0. In other words, to say that is drawer 0 and drawer 1 are in the same cache line. Okay. So go back to the gnomes. Imagine that I have my gnomes here, and our drawers are very close together. So they're very close together. So when a gnome comes in here, he's like, I want to get into my drawer. He pushes the gnome next to him out of the way. And this like, I want to get in my drawer. He pushes the gnome out of the way. So they keep getting in each other's way. So imagine a bunch of gnomes with very small space between the drawers. Okay. They have no elbow room. What we need to do is give these gnomes elbow room so they can get into their drawer. So I'm going to give them a drawer, but some space around it so that this gnome over here has plenty of elbow room, and he's not going to interfere with this guy's drawer over here. This would be much better with the picture, I realize. OK. <laughs> Fair enough. So what's the uh, false sharing solution? Really simple. You fill out the drawer so it's the size of a cache line. Very simple idea. OK? This is the one that's important. We're adding 64 bytes so that we fill it out so that a drawer is a cache line. This one made some difference in the work we did previously. I'm not convinced we need this as much, but I wanted to put it in there um, as well, because it can make it so that you can cache the upper bound potentially, and you're not currently going in and out of cache. So I'm not as sure you need this one. But our previous work suggested sometimes it was helpful, but this is the real important one. Yes, sir. Absolutely, that's absolutely right. The problem is we don't necessarily know how big the cache lines are. And this is the. Yeah, this Fair enough, fair enough. Um, this is to give you the, the course idea, and absolutely, that would be a way to, uh, uh, to optimize a little bit better, absolutely. Um, the question was, why do we not just use 64 minus, let's say, 4, because that's the size of the int, so that it actually completely fills the cache line and doesn't break out into it? And he's absolutely right. We probably should have made this 60 and 60, so that this is one cache line and this is one cache line. 
Okay. Ah. If we do our cupboard timings with the negligible work type up to about six threads, we seem to fix the problem. So with a negligible work type using a cupboard, we can actually achieve thread neutrality up to about six processors. Fantastic. And just to make sure we don't break the sum and the ample, everything looks fine. OK. But we still have a niggling little problem. What about the tail end here? We've said, I mean, it looks great up to six processors, but this machine, if you look at top, top says it has 12 processors, and I'm doing terrible performance up to the 12th processor. Saunders, what are you doing wrong? So I'm going to blame somebody else. I'm going to blame the culprit is hyperthreading, also known as simultaneous multithreading. Uh, this is what they call it in a lot of, um, um, like the ACM literature and the IEEE papers. They call it simultaneous multithreading. So ideally, hyperthreading, this is a very simplified explanation, allows you to reuse uh, functional units inside your CPU. You have your CPU, I'm blowing it up to it be this big, it's a really big CPU. You have this part of the chip right here has hardware that does floating point operations. And this part of the chip down here does integer operations. Okay, what usually happens if you put a thread through here, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm a thread, I'm doing floating point operations. This part of the silicon is, is dark because nothing's going on. The only part that's really bright and lit up is the floating point stuff because that's where information's flowing. Then the next thread comes along, it's like, it only does integer operations. But unfortunately, the floating point stuff up here is dark silicon because it's not doing anything. So the idea behind hyperthreading is, what if we allow two threads through the processor at the same time one that does integer work can actually go at the same time as the thread that does floating point work. Ideally, this would give us a net gain of 2x because we could have two threads executing in parallel. I want to make it clear, this is a hardware-supported thing. The processor gives you the abstraction to support hyper-threading. Okay? And this is why a 6-core or 6-CPU machine looks like a 12-CPU machine because if you bring up top, it shows you 12 threads because the hardware, the operating system, has exposed these hyper threads as real threads. Okay? Um, on older versions of Linux, you could actually boot a machine with no HT, and it would actually turn off hyper threading, so it would only show six threads. I don't, I kind of remember last time I tried this, it didn't work, but if you really wanted to turn off hyper threading, you can. I believe there's some way to do that in most operating systems. Okay? All right. Unfortunately, hyperthreading can be problematic. For the CAF computation, remember this is all Josh's fault. We started the thing saying this is Josh's fault for making me look at the CAF. All the CAF stuff, it's all floating point. You're doing uh, convolutions with floating point numbers, doing inverse FFTs, floating point numbers. Everything that's going on when you're doing a CAF is floating point operations, okay? So the worst thing that could possibly happen on a hyper-threaded machine is, let's say I've got six CPUs, the machine I was on before, and some naive scheduler comes in, and it schedules two floating point operations on this CPU. Oh, only one can get through. The other guy's sitting here saying, oh, I, I want to get in here at the same CPU, but the only thing that's available is an integer unit. So where this guy thread could be running in parallel on one of these other processes over here, it gets stuck serialized behind the other thread that's doing floating point work. So in the worst possible case for scientific computation is that a naive scheduler may cut your performance by 2x. This two threads, this thread that over here could run in parallel over here, if they scheduled on the same machine where you have the hyper threading, oh, you could serialize behind each other. Okay? Now, um, this is sort of hyper threading in its original form. It's gotten better. It's not quite as bad as it used to be. They've done a little bit better of having um, uh, buffers that make it so you can move stuff through, and it's not quite as bad as it used to be, but it still can be potentially an issue. Especially for us, we care about floating point computation, and that's where the bugaboo is. Okay? So, in real code, a scheduler decides where to run threads, and sometimes things work out, and sometimes they don't. If it schedules uh, two of these guys together on the same CPU, so that you can't run in parallel, well, it's just kind of the way it goes. All right? So this is schedule or regular letters. Hyper-threading can really interfere with how your floating point program gets scheduled. OK? 
Okay. Now we're not, like I said, one very good solution, which I think this fellow here pointed out earlier, is you could use processor affinity and make sure that these threads are only scheduled. And like I said, that's a great solution, but it's, you have to be careful because sometimes that doesn't scale well, uh, especially if you have, you have a code that runs on many different types of machines. Okay, so what our purpose here is to recognize that this is an issue and we're hoping that the schedule is good enough that it won't do too much of this, okay? And so what do we do with the problem? I was saying that our code isn't thread neutral up to 12 processors. We redefine the problem. <laughs> we cheat. We say, if we consider this six CPU machine with hyper-threading to be a six, six floating point unit machine, there's only six floating point units in our machine. So we can't ever do any better than 6x. Yes, sir? Yes, yes. Like I said, oh, the, the, the question was, the graph suggests that the, uh, the processor schedule tends to schedule on real processors first and then the hyperthreads. And like I said, we're sort of praying to the God of the scheduler that you will do the right thing. And it appears that was happening on our machine. Yes, at least on our test machine. Okay. So we redefine the problem. If we talk about six floating point units, we were able to achieve perfect speed up. Okay. I know we're cheating as we redefine the problem, but the problem really was we're doing floating point operations on a machine and the only, we only have six floating point units. So that's the, the best speed up we can hope to get is the six X speed up. Um, and there's another sanity check on hyperthreading. If you don't believe, you think I'm kind of making up stuff here. There's a real good paper out of Sigmetrics 2005. It's a little dated, but it talks about what are the effects of using um, multi-threading on network servers with the, using real hardware. Very good paper. Um, I think it was out of IBM. Okay. One, of the, one of the things I remember explicitly from that paper was they showed that they showed the problem we discussed. There is a worst possible case where you can actually, hyperthreading can slow down your original program. Okay. So remember, this is all about the calf. Let's go back to the calf. The original purpose of the bag was to make calf processing faster. We want to mit mitigate scheduling irregularities, and we want to dole out the work dynamically so overzealous workers can pick up the slack of slacker worker threats, <coughs> Fred, <coughs> who's got went to get his pizza. Okay. So let's talk about our real calf. Um, in real calf code, negligible doesn't actually make a lot of sense. They're doing an FFT per calf line. There is no way this is negligible work. If you know anything about FFTs, you're like, yep, that's an expensive operation. It's going to be at least probably 100 operations, if not more. Okay? For our application, the sum work type was never historically a problem. Um, this application that we've had actually quite a bit of time, which uh, generates calves, the calves were typically much smaller historically. They're like a second, two seconds, and we never saw the slowest worker problem. Okay? The only time we saw it was when Josh was like, dude, let's do a 20 minute long calf. When we did the ample work type, that's when we started seeing the irregular completion times. And it makes sense. A longer running piece of work is much more likely to suffer the effects of poor scheduling due to hyperthreading other applications and so on. So a longer running calf, of course, scheduling is going to become weirder and weirder the longer it runs. Okay? So this is the one, this is the one that, that we're attacking. So our goal here is twofold. We want to make sure we speed up the calf in the ample work case. And goal two is we want to make sure we don't affect the way the application used to work. My boss is very, um, let's say, uh, aware of the fact that this code has been around for a very long time. He's like, Rich, if you touch my code, you better not make it slower. You know, you're in big trouble. So that's why we need to make sure that we don't at least affect things that weren't historically a problem in a bad way. So that's why I want to make sure we don't hinder the running times of our previous work. Okay? We shouldn't, but of course, I'm not going to convince my boss that unless I actually run some timing tests. Okay, so these timing tests are A, they're on a different machine, and B, this is actually the timing of the entire application. So the entire application that has the calf internally actually does a whole lot of processing up front and some processing at the very end. So this is not exactly the same graphs we saw before. Right? Um, what we see here is it takes 80 seconds, it doesn't matter how many threads we throw at it, for a very small amount of work. Not really a big change there. 
In fact, it was so obvious there was no change, I kind of stopped after like four threads. I'm like, there's obviously no changes here. Okay. For the ample time, so this is a slightly larger calf that ran for a little bit larger time. By using a bag instead of the a priori schedule, uh, it seemed to move smooth out stuff a little bit so that we were maybe a little bit faster, but you could argue that's in the noise of the system. Okay. For a little bit larger calves, maybe that ran for a couple minutes, it made a little bit of difference. But of course, this is where we saw um, the best performance. In the a priori, we see it's kind of irregular. Sometimes it's faster, sometimes it's slower, sometimes it's faster. But if we had a bag as the implementation, it smoothed out the effects and typically made it run faster. Okay? And again, why we see this randomness, this sort of spike on the, um, uh, on the upper one, the a priori schedule, because the schedule and everything else can get in the way. Yes, sir? Okay. Both, both. The, um, the image is much larger. Oh, the question is, is, my, is the calf larger because the image is larger, or what was the second part of the question? Or was it just like you were doing a different transform or a different uh, we're, we're basically just doing a larger FFT over a larger range. So it's, it's larger, it, it, the, the, the surface is larger because we're doing um, more lines and larger FFTs. Yeah, right, more pixels across. Mm -hmm. We were trying, well, the original thought was we wanted to preserve, since it's actually writing straight to memory, is we wanted to try to preserve some notion of cacheness. It feels like if we split it up like this, we might potentially be slogging through the cache. It, what, it, I was wondering, that's why I'm wondering. Are you thinking slogging through? The worker mm -hmm. are going line after line. Yes. Yes, that's true. That's very true. Right. With, with, with the, if, once we move to the cupboard, though, that does, it's more, a little bit more like the a priori because each cupboard has you know, a different set of integers. So when we're doing the cupboard, it's... Right. right. That's good because I want to compare it. They're a little more apples to apples that way. Right. Okay. So what this ended up being, what we saw, Josh's calf was about 20% faster most of the time. Um, we didn't affect the working time of the previous application. So my boss didn't fire me. He says, you didn't break my code. Thank you. But what you did make Josh's running case faster. And that was the whole purpose of this. Basically, I spent a month and a half or maybe a month working on this because I wanted to make Josh happy. So they only spent 15 minutes building a calf as opposed to 20 minutes. So I saved him five minutes so he could go to lunch or get a Coke. So, okay. And so all threads finished about the same time, thanks to the bag, when computing the calf, which achieved our original purpose, making it feel like we're using the whole machine the whole time, rather than having uh, guys like Fred come in and solely slough off. Okay. Um, this goes back to your question earlier. You might ask yourselves, hey, Rich, why didn't you have a perfect speed up line? Um, yes, sir? Um, the previous implementation was a priori. Oh, the, the, what the, the question was, did your previous version use uh, 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 convars or something like that? Well, mutex. What we did is we only used uh, convars for the final barrier synchronize, but pretty much we had, we had no synchronization between the code. It was just, you get these 30 lines, you get these 30 lines, and you get these 30 lines, and there was no other communication between them. Okay. All right, so this goes back to your question. This is another form of collateral damage. Uh, you might ask yourselves, why did we not see a perfect speed up line when we were talking about uh, the calves? Well, part of the problem is the calves inherently break cache. If you've done anything with very large FFTs, they don't sit in cache very well at all. You're computing stuff over a whole array of stuff. Um, they stride across memory and they tax your memory system to its very limits. So if you have something running a very large FFT, it's very hard for another thread to get in and run because your memory subsystem is taxed so heavily. You try to get to the bus and you know what, you're uh, uh, moving stuff over the bus as fast as you possibly can to do these FFTs because there's not very much caching when you do very large FFTs. So this is another form of collateral damage um, if you have too much memory traffic and it keeps other threads from running. Okay. Does, does that make sense? Okay. Um, at one point we had 
a machine with an 800 megahertz front side bus. And we had another sh machine, I think it was a 1.2 1 megahertz or 1.2 gigahertz front side bus. They were pretty much exactly the same machine except for the front side bus. We saw a direct correlation between uh, if this machine was 20% faster only in the front side bus, the calf was 20% faster. This tells you that the calf is all about how fast you can get to the memory subsystem. Okay? And the memory subsystem is getting hard by all threads. And the whole point of this is hard to get perfect speed ups on calves because you hit memory so hard. In fact, what it almost argues you should do is uh, distribute your calf, if it's going to take 20 minutes, among multiple machines so you can take advantage of multiple memory systems on multiple machines. Okay. Okay. Conclusions. We saw two different types of bags that are useful for different applications. We saw the drawer, which was useful in most situations. It was simple, fast, easy to interface. And it builds on the uh, single C++11 atomic primitive. Um, and if you don't have it, you can still use GNU. The cupboard was better for high speed extractions. It's built on the drawer, but it has a slightly more complex interface. So depending on the type of work you want to do, the drawer or the cupboard may be the better solution for you, okay? Um, this led me to the, um, this interfaces came from trying some synthetic tests, but of course what really mattered is real world numbers, okay? We saw that the bag, in our form, was at least as good as the a priori division of work, but it's better than a priori division for the ample work type. And the very thing, the thing you should conclude all this, remember I wasn't claiming to save the world or to make your threaded application 2x or 10x faster. What I'm really trying to do is help you mitigate scheduling irregularities. And that's kind of the whole purpose of the bag because you can dynamically dole out your work and make your scheduler a little bit happier. Okay? Uh, I, I think that's it, unless there are any other questions. Yes, sir. Uh, sure. Uh, no, not for this. Th this pro oh, th so have I ever tried using a, a, a work stealing task here or something like this? For this problem, no, I didn't. We actually, like I said, this started with Josh's in Josh's office, the calf. I knew the implementation. I knew it was some POSIX thread stuff. And I'm like, oh, you know, if we just changed it slightly, I bet we could get a speed up. So I didn't what I introduced into the code was smallish. Um, so we have not tried that. But you, you could also always argue that almost every problem is just a different version of the priority queue too, right? So. <laughs> Almost every data structure can be rethought of as some kind of priority queue. Yes, sir. Um, I've seen a little bit of OpenMP. Oh, please repeat the question. Have I tried anything with OpenMP? Um, some of the systems that this stuff run on were oldish and didn't support OpenMP to my knowledge, so I have not. I suspect we would see similar performance because OpenMP is you know, the exact same model, the work queue where you distribute stuff out, and then synthesize it back to a source. Yes, sir. So have I considered something where, uh, with the cupboard, where everyone starts with his own drawer and then goes to a shared drawer? I didn't. Um, that might be, that might make some sense. Like I said, the, what I found was that I tried a whole bunch of ideas after the cupboard in my performance tests, they never seem to make uh, uh, much difference. Because th the only time that there's usually the contention was at the very end. So you're sort of allowed to, at the, like one little blip, micro blip in time, to let them kind of go, blah! So. Yes, sir. Tony? Okay. Let's see, I'm supposed to repeat the question for the camera. Um, what if we, uh, <laughs> what if we uh, made it so that um, we could skip lines of the bag so that maybe we could distribute the work better? Is that kind of the sense of your question? You want, you want your threads as most as possible to walk through memory in order. Oh, okay. 
Yes. And we'd like to do it sequentially if possible. So, so could, we, could we make it so that our threads walk through memory in a sequential manner so we could take advantage of maybe some notion of caching or some notion of the, uh, of the memory bus? I, with the fetch add, you can, you can use any number you want, right? So, so we, maybe we could do a very simple skip. Oh, well, I see what you're saying. You might have to actually use the lock and then the, uh, right. I, I don't know. Right. I don't know too much ab uh, about the Intel. Say that again? It's one instruction no matter what. How much you add. So, so that might be a, a real interesting thing to try. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Niall? Okay. So I'm going to try to repeat <laughs> what you said for the camera. First of all, that the later Intel processors, uh, they have a notion of uh, prefetching so that it can make your cache lines look like they're 128 big. So you might have to potentially worry about your padding there. And the second thing is he, um, 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 you were talking about, I guess, basically an SSC scheduler where you could have a dynamic dispatch through that. Um, I'm not sure I said that very well. I, I, said, I definitely want to talk to you about this off offline and, and hear more about that. Um, yes, sir. Oh, absolutely, yes, I'm sorry, yes, absolutely. The FFT, it's FFTW, compile this pause, we get, you, you're not going to get much faster than the FFTW. It, it, it tends to beat even the Intel intrinsic primitives as well. So our FFTs are taking advantage of SSC instructions already. The, the, this, code is, is, this code has been optimized to an inch of its life. I work at a DSP company. We care about FFTs. So, okay. Thank you very much for your time. Please have a wonderful time at C++ Now. Thank you for your consideration.